The Palette 2 is getting a second chance thanks to this 2S upgrade kit. It wasn't easy, but I think I'm finally making ground. Previously, Mosaic sent me this palette too. It's a machine that turns your single extruder printer into one capable of doing four different colors at once. My results were mixed. Most of the time it worked well on the Prusa Mark III, but on the Ender 3, I had very little luck. For this video, I've purchased the 2S upgrade kit. I'm gonna fit it and take you through all of my testing so you can see if things have improved. I'll also show you how I made this color changing voxelized pyramid. Let's get into it. You might have noticed on the wall behind me in my studio is a palette too. And I previously made a video on this labeled an honest review. Let me tell you why. As a piece of tech, the palette too is something to marvel at. I could stare at it all day. And I did manage to get some really, really nice multicolor prints. Apart from a little bit of bleeding on the black into red on the back of this glove, overall, this print was immaculate. It worked pretty well with the Prusa Mark III, but every now and again, it would have a print that was just completely garbled for color. When testing with the Ender 3, it was much worse. I could get the calibration keyring to print successfully, but any actual multicolor prints I tried were completely messed up. This seemed pretty consistent with what I was seeing on the Mosaic forums, with some people achieving stunning results and other people really struggling like I did on the Ender 3. After the review, I pushed on trying to get it to work reliably with the Ender 3, and support were extremely friendly and helpful, despite the fact I could never get the second calibration print to complete successfully. We noticed that the splices my palette was producing were slightly bulged, and I went through a range of fixes, such as changing the tube that lines the splicer core. You can see the old one on the bottom is slightly bumpy. After this change, I still couldn't complete the calibration print. On the advice of support, I moved on to splice tuning, where you change the heat, compression, and cooling of the splices with the aim of finding the perfect combination for your filament to get smooth, reliable, strong splices. My best results, however, still had a bulge of around 0.1 millimeter in diameter. I figured this was getting partially stuck on the slightly narrower Capricorn tube, and the standard extruder didn't have the grip to push the bulge through cleanly. I tried redesigning parts of the factory extruder that eventually led to me designing this EZR adapter to go on my modular direct drive kit. Unfortunately, the same result. I still couldn't get the second calibration print to complete and the Pallet 2 has sat idle on the wall since then. A few months ago, Joel from 3D Printing Nerd released a new video on the Pallet 2. In that, I learned that regular Pallet 2s are being run out at a reduced cost because now the 2S and 2S Pro are the latest and greatest available. If you already have an existing Palette 2 or 2 Pro, you can buy this S upgrade kit. And that's exactly what I did for this video at a price of 124 US dollars. The big thing for me is that the changes for the S version were all about reliability and that's the one thing I didn't have. The key component I was interested in was the new splice core. A week or so later, the package arrived and I took the time to see what was included. Apart from the mosaic stickers and the special torque screwdriver, we had new switches, new steel thumb screws, new lever arms for the filament gripping mechanisms, some splice core liners of which I also ordered extra, and the new splice core S. It was time to install, so I removed the pallet 2 from the bracket on the wall. The first step in the instructions was to update the firmware and there's a one-click operation for this, and I'm pleased to report that this time round, it worked perfectly. The documentation for the S upgrade is extremely good, with a video guide, as well as text instructions, as well as animations to support each section. We start installation by removing all of the old thumb screws, and then removing the clear plastic covers that cover the components that will be switched. First up are the lever arms, and I believe the main change here is switching to a clear material so you can see what's happening inside. One screw is undone, and then the new part goes into place exactly as before. We torque this up, but not so tight that the lever arm isn't free to move. After this, we repeat for the other four, three down the bottom, and then one up the top for the outgoing drive. Next up, we need to replace the micro switches. There's five of these again, four on the inputs of each drive, and then another one on the buffer. Again, a single screw holds this in place, but the tricky bit is there's also a plug underneath. 
you need to be careful to stop this plug from falling back inside the machine. I used these little pick tools, they were effective and the bottom four were quite easy to get done. We repeat this process for the other three switches along the bottom before we tackle the fifth switch up the top. This one is harder because the wires leading to the plug aren't as long. I couldn't get my pick tools into position to hold the plug in place to connect from above. Therefore, I needed to remove four screws and take off the lower cover off the machine. We can now easily access the plug that was quite difficult before, reach underneath, plug in the new sensor, flip everything back over and put in the retaining screw. Our second last component is the homing sensor. We need to rotate the cutting arm, remove the plastic cover, and this one, like the others, is held by a single screw and plug. With all of the components so far, it was extremely hard to tell the difference between them apart from the S markings. Nevertheless, I plugged in the new sensor and held it back in place with the screw before putting on the clear plastic cover. Our final component was the new splice core, and visually there was definitely a difference between these two, with the new element pictured here on the right being a lot smaller. This was the easiest component of all to change, it simply pushes into place with a single silver thumb screw to retain it. I took the time to compare the new and old thumb screws. We can see the old ones are aluminium, the new ones are steel and therefore magnetic. To finish up, we use the new thumb screws to retain the plastic covers and then finally put back on the lid. When I fired up the machine, I went to the menu and did a factory reset and then went through the initial calibration process. This involves loading up some filament and then the pallet makes a small splice testing the reading of its sensors throughout the machine versus the factory settings and I'm pleased to say that mine was very close. The best thing was that after this calibration, I thought visually the splices looked a little bit smoother than before. I now turned my attention to the online canvas slicer and deleted my old printer profiles, instead going for some of the ones built into the slicer. Looking at the Ender 3 profile, the settings seemed pretty good. I needed to change my Bowden tube to zero because I had direct drive. Apart from that, the bed size needed to be upped from 220 to 235. And I also noted there was a G29 in place for auto bed leveling. If your printer doesn't have this, it doesn't matter. The command is just ignored. I then added a pallet 2S to my configuration and set it to be running from a canvas hub. That's basically a plugin for Octoprint and I covered it in detail in my initial video. I now had access to the Ender 3 slicing profile and the only things I needed to change were my retraction to suit the direct drive extruder and later on I also worked out the part cooling fan was not enabled for PLA by default. With these steps complete, I could prepare my first prints. I thought it best to start with the simplest calibration keychain on the Prusa Mark III. The G-code preview looked good, so I sent the file over to the Canvas Hub, also known as Octoprint, took a deep breath and clicked the print button. The palette has a great process to help you calibrate your printer for the machine. I covered this in detail in the first video. It went smoothly in this case. And after a couple of minutes, I had my first print underway. And not too long after that, the first layer was completed and the first color transition looked perfect. Sure enough, a little under an hour later on, the print had finished perfectly and there was just a little bit of filament left in the printer, which is exactly how it's meant to be. The second calibration print uses four colors instead of just two. While it was printing, I checked the pings and pongs, which are communications the palette uses to keep in sync, and they seemed quite good. The result being another perfect test print, with perfect color separation. Time to switch to the Ender 3. The two color keyring turned out perfectly, matching what I'd been able to achieve before. So I loaded up the four color earbud holder, that one also worked very well with perfect color separation, but as you can see, the filament snapped on the way into the machine, causing the top of the object not to be printed. We were off to an excellent start, with three out of four prints being successful and the other one failing not because of the palette too. So I pushed on, printing this two color star on the Mark III. In terms of the palette, it was 100% successful with perfect color separation. At the original scale of the STL as downloaded, the hinges were just too small and they failed later on. I'm not sure why the STL is released this small. Confident, I picked out this mandala as a torture test to go in my wife's classroom. Because I was impatient, I decided to scale the STLs down. As you can see on the early layers, the color separation was good, but then the details were too small and it caused the nozzle to hit and cause a lot of layer shifts, 
another failed print. An updated scoreboard adds another successful print and another failure that wasn't due to the palette too. Back to the end of three for an attempt at this four color world. And the first attempt, well, it was a fail and that's because filament snapped on the way into the machine and it looked pretty good up until then. I was using the same green and blue filament that snapped earlier on on the earbud holder. Attempt two was pretty close. This is the print where I realized the part cooling fan was not turned on by default. In terms of color separation, I'd probably give it a nine out of 10. There was a couple of thin bands where the color wasn't matched properly, but snap filament was ultimately what killed it. I switched back to the Mark III for more attempts at the fidget star. This one was going perfectly until once again, the filament splice snapped. I switched the white out for gray PLA and it came loose. As this model is meant to be printed without support, the top four segments aren't really held in place. In this case, some of them were quite wobbly, collided with the nozzle, and that's what caused the failure. Color separation, however, was sublime. In my case, it was a matter of fourth time lucky. Now I can finally demonstrate how this thing works, so you can see how cool it is and why I persisted. You can also see the rough parts where the top segments are unsupported as they commence printing. A cool STL, but slightly flawed, too small and it fuses together, too big and the gaps are too large to support itself. Color separation, a nine out of 10, one stray maroon line. Some more success, some more failures, but none that I would still consider the fault of the Palette 2S. On my final piece, I wanted to make something that I'd had in mind for a long time. And I started with this 3D solid with eight sides. It was then imported into this online voxelizer. The link for this is in the description and there's a couple of things you need to get right. Firstly, this right hand slider needs to be set to one, otherwise there'll be gaps in between your voxels. And the second one's not so obvious, but you need to have this slider the whole way to the right, otherwise your object will be hollow. And when you go to print it, it's gonna be very difficult. Apart from that, the final slider defines the resolution of the finished shape. The lower the number, the blockier it becomes, the higher the number, the smoother the final shape. When I was done, I exported as an STL. What I was trying to create was a shape that would print support free like this voxelized skull from Make Anything. The idea is you paint the voxels a different color on each side, so as it rotates, the object appears to change color. This was going to be possible on the palette too because their slicer canvas has an awesome new feature. If you click on an object, you can select the paint tool, turn on orthographic for the camera, and now you can brush the individual triangles of the STL to various colors. In my case, this is a pretty tedious process, but that's because of the type of geometry that I'm painting and the way that I'm painting it. If you just wanna do some regular brushing, there is a sphere brush tool, you can change the size and then you can paint things quite quickly. There's also a paint bucket tool to change whole colors at a time. And this create regions tool can go around the model and add boundaries. So when you come back with the paint bucket tool, you can do whole sections one click at a time. What's really exciting is there's also a stamp tool where you upload a regular picture like a JPEG, you can then scale and position before stamping the colors onto your object. In my case, I couldn't use these tools because I needed the colors to be exact, but eventually my hard work paid off. I had four different colors around my object and when I rotated it, it appeared to magically change color. Once you've done this painting, you can quickly select which colors you want and they'll be reapplied without having to repaint anything. Upon slicing the model, I found it pretty interesting how the internal colors were placed so it wasn't printing tiny squares at a time and I sent the file to the printer. And guess what? It failed again, once again, because the filament snapped inside the palette before it got to the printer. At least it was looking promising at this stage, but I really did need to fix this problem. To explain, I've got this simplified diagram of how the system works. It's important to realize that the printer pulls the filament through rather than the palette pushing it towards the printer. And inside the palette, after it's spliced in the splice core, it goes through a loop in the buffer. PLA may be brittle compared to other filaments, but it can still be fairly flexible. Once we splice it together, however, it's going to have a tendency to snap where the joins are. Let's say mid print, we have one of these snaps inside the buffer section. The printer will continue to pull the filament through. The palette is unable to do anything about this. The printer runs out of filament and the print inevitably fails. To fix this problem, we have splice tuning, where we can change the heat, compression and cooling of the splices in order to make them reliable. In my case, my splices were brittle 
and the instruction page tells you exactly what you should try to try and strengthen them up. In practice, we enter our three numbers on the control panel, hit the button, wait for it to make the splice and then eject it from the machine. We can then inspect the splice for strength and then I highly recommend recording the result on a piece of paper. After several rounds, hopefully you find a setting that does the job for you. In my case, I was able to bend the splice back on itself and the filament just to the side of it actually bent and the splice remained intact. How I wish I had done this at the start. Back in Canvas, we enter our three parameters and then save them and then any models you already have sliced, it's just a matter of going through and selecting the splice overrides for each of the four colors. I re-sliced and was ready for my ultimate torture test. A printing time of one full day with 844 total splices. If this would work, then I figured anything would. 28 hours later, I was so glad to have a successful print. The color separation was flawless and the effect I wanted was in place. The white on top was too thin and you can see the colors underneath, but apart from that, as you twist it from side to side, it magically seems to change color. With this print, I feel like I've reached the point where the Palette 2S will now be reliable. Going back to the score sheet, I still don't think I had any failures that were down to the Palette 2. And if I'd done the splice tuning at the very beginning, without all those failures from snapped filament, things would have been quite different. Not to say that this machine is perfect. It does cost a lot of money, and it's probably not something the average person would buy just to have a crack. The purge blocks consume a lot of filament, for instance this pyramid was 98 grams and the purge block came in at a whopping 290 grams. The palette 2 can only splice and feed through filament so fast, therefore the print times are quite slow. But if you do want up to 4 colour printing and you're willing to put in the time to get everything tuned and reliable, I now think this product has a much better chance of getting the job done. In hindsight, I wish I had done the splice tuning at the very beginning, but the idea at the time was to test how the upgrades worked out of the box. I still think the Palette 2 is better suited to a 3D printer with dual hobbed extruder like a Bontech as found on my Mark III. I'm excited by what the slicing software is capable of and hopefully soon they upgrade it further by introducing some measures to cut down on these wasteful purge blocks. You've seen my experiences, so now I'd like to read about your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy multicolor 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.